The convention will please come to order. As a reminder, I'd like to ask everyone to please silence your cell phones and portable devices. If you can, please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to our nation's flag. Salute. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing. Chaplain Varner, would you please lead us in prayer? Good morning. May we pray. Almighty God, the mighty creator of all men, we give you thanks this morning for allowing us to be in your presence. We thank you for the bountiful blessings of our friends, our comrades, even our visitors who are visiting with us today. Now we ask that you grant us strength and guidance as we go on throughout this day, that we're well able to train and to serve and to give out unto others what have been given unto us. We ask these things of you and the people said, Amen. Amen. Thank, you. Thank you, Chaplain Varner. Please be seated. I remind each of you that in order for a delegate to be heard at this convention, you must be recognized by the chair. Only those delegates at a microphone will be recognized. Upon being so recognized, delegates must state their name chapter number, and the state they represent. I'd like to call on Credentials Committee Chairman and fellow Tampa 4 chapter member, Brenda Reed, for a report. Good morning. Good morning. National Commander, Marshal, National Adjutant Burgess, officers, members, and guests. The Credentials Committee met this morning at 8 a.m. in Florida Ballroom A at the Hyatt Regency in Orlando, Florida. Roll call shows 981 delegates, 63 alternates have registered, which includes 45 departments and 348 chapters registered. There are nine national officers, 21 national executive committeemen, and six, passional, six past national commanders, currently registered for a total of 7,784 votes. This partial report is for informational purposes only, and it reflects the registration at the close of business at 4 p.m. on August 8, 2022. This completes the partial report of the Credentials Committee. Thank you, Brenda. You're welcome, Andy. Uh, a reminder that registration will close this morning at 10 a.m. Next, I would like to call on Chairman Joe Hall for the report of the Committee on Employment. Comrade Commander and Delegates, the National Convention Committee on Employment was called to order on August 7, 2022 by the Committee Advisors Rob Lugie and Anthony Lewis. The first order of business was the election of the Convention Committee Chairman and Secretary. Joe Hall of North Dakota was elected Chairman and Tiffany Kaler of Wisconsin was elected as Secretary. The committee then pro, uh, proceeded to review the resolutions and, and uh, submitted, and I will now report to you the resolutions recommended for adoption by the National Convention. For the purposes of saving time, I will read only the number and the purpose of the resolution. 45, eliminate the delimiting date for eligible spouses and surviving spouses of benefits provided under Chapter 35, Title 38, USC. 46, support licensure and certification of active duty service personnel. 47, support outreach and employment of women veterans. 
159, eliminate the 12 year rule to request VA veteran readiness and employment benefits under chapter 31, leaving the date to apply for that benefit open ended. 160, monitor activities of, man of the mandatory transition GPS program. 183, provide adequate funding and permanency for veterans employment and or training programs. 184, support extension of a period of employment services under VA veteran readiness and employment services. 185, require the United States Congress to create a work projects program which guarantees federal employment to service disabled veterans. 186, support legislation to extend the duration of the VA veteran readiness and employment benefits beyond 48 months. 187, support the adoption of programs and legislation to reduce barriers to employment, education, and full use and access to the other benefits earned through the service in the military. 188, protect veterans from employment discrimination when receiving health care, uh, when receiving health care for service-connected conditions. 214, remove requirement that the VA compensation to service-connected veterans is counted as income for the purposes of federal financial aid determinations. 215, support prompt payment of contracts to service disabled veteran owned businesses. 216, support legislation enhancing government wide goals for participation by small business owned and controlled by service disabled veterans. 217, support legislation to improve and protect education and employment benefits for disabled veterans and their survivors. 218, support legislation and reimburse, replace, and extend education, vocational benefits for disabled veterans and their survivors for education, training, and training impacted by COVID-19. 347, provide educational benefits for dependents of service disabled veterans rated 80% or more disabled. 349, support veterans' preference in public employment. 403, adequate staffing levels um, of the VA Veteran Readiness and Employment Service. 404, support legislation to provide a reasonable transition period for service disabled veteran owned small businesses to retain federal protected status following the death of the disabled veteran owner. 405, create an economic opportunity administration within the Department of Veteran Affairs. 406, support fraud prevention controls over service disabled veteran owned small business programs. 407, support verification improvements for veteran owned businesses within the VA. 408, oppose using uh, DVOP and LVER to work with to work with or process assistance programs unrelated to veterans. 438, support legislation to strengthen and protect service disabled veteran owned small businesses. 439, support legislation to create, improve, and reform federal programs for service disabled veteran entrepreneurship. Comrade Commander, this completes the report of the Committee on Employment. On behalf of the committee, I move the adoption of these resolutions and that the committee be discharged with the thanks of the National Convention. Thank you, Joe. <clears throat> we have heard the motion. May I have a second, please? Mike three. Mike three. Comrade Commander, Albert J. Bacon, Sr., Department of Florida Commander, Chapter 17, so moves. In, accord, in accordance with Rule 9, now is the time for any rejected resolutions to be read. Are there any rejected resolutions you wish read? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? So ordered. I would like to call upon Chairman Lee Gidden for the report of the Committee on Legislation and Veterans' Rights. Good 
Good morning. Dear comrades, commander and delegates, the National Convention Committee on Legislation and Veteran Rights was called to order on Sunday, August 7, 2022, by the committee advisors Joy Elam and Shade Lieberman. The first order of business was to election of Convention Committee Chairman and Secretary. W. Lee Gidden was elected chairman. Marguerite Stubbs was elected secretary. The committee then proceeded to review the resolutions submitted, and I will now report on the resolutions recommended for adoption by the National Con Convention. For the purpose of saving time, I will read only the number for this, only the number and purpose of the resolution. Number 002. Support legislation to reduce the 10-year rule for dependency and indemnity compensation. Number six, oppose all attempts to change the basis of the Department of Veterans Affairs rating schedule for the average impairments and earnings cap capacity standard. Number 007, oppose any recommendation by any commission or other source to reduce and eliminate benefits for disabled veterans. Number 008, Oppose reduction, taxation, and elimination of veterans' benefits. Number 009, increase grant funding for local cemeteries. Number 032, increase the grant and special adaptive equipment reimbursement rates for automobiles and other conveyances to certain disabled veterans and authorize reimbursement for new adaptive equipment technologies. Number 033, support legislation to improve the VA fiduciary program. Number 035, support legislation providing that special separation benefit payments not be withheld from VA disability compensation payments. Number 063, support legislation authorizing presumptive service connection based on herbicide exposure for military personnel that served on the bases in Thailand during the Vietnam War. Number 066, protect claimants from those charging fees for VA claims presentation, preparation, and prosecution. Number 068, reform and improve service-connected disability veterans' life insurance. Number 069, streamline and improve specially adapted housing and special housing adaptation grants. Number 070, support VA modernization of information technology and improvements to include digital sharing, adequate funding, and improve access for disabled veterans. Number 072, support legislation for the studies and presumptive diseases related to PFAS exposure. Number 073, support legislation for health care and concession for exposure for burn pits. Number 074, support legislation to remove the prohibition against DAV members who are federal employees from communication on behalf of the DAV and with federal agencies. Number 075, support reauthorization of the Persian Gulf War Act, per Persian Gulf Veterans Act, excuse me. Number 076, support reauthorization of the Agent Orange Act. Number 077, support legislation to provide studies related to the health care and benefits resulting from tox toxic exposures at K2. Number 084, oppose the long-term rounding down of COLAs in veterans' benefits. Number 085, support legislation that would exempt the benefits paid to wartime service-connected disabled veterans for the pay-go, cut-go provisions in the Budget Enforcement Act. Number 086, amend the law to provide 10-year protection for service-connected disability ratings. Number 087, support legislation to provide for service connection for disabling conditions resulting from toxic and environmental exposures. Number 088, oppose any proposal that would reduce payments for Department of Veterans Affairs disability compensation by payments of Social Security disability insurance or any other federal benefit paid to the veteran. Number 089, 
consider treatment of presumptive service-connected conditions as a claim for VA compensation. Number 092, support legislation to remove the prohibition against concurrent receipt of longevity retired pay and veterans disability compensation for all longevity retired veterans. Number 093, support interest payments of Department of Veterans Affairs retroactive awards for one year or more. Number 094, support legislation to provide for presumptive service connection for tinnitus and hearing loss. Number 095, support meaningful claims for appeals reform. Number 096, ex expand presumptions for service connection for former POWs. Number 097, support legislation for the VA to provide child care services and or assistance to veterans attending VA programs. Number 099, support legislation to increase disability compensation. Number 100, support legislation to allow all veterans to recover amounts withheld as tax on disability severance pay. Number 101, support legislation that requires VA to consider private medical evidence provided by licensed private health care providers. Number 102, support legislation to provide for realistic cost of living allowances. Number 104, support legislation to include veterans disability compensation from accountable income for purposes of, of eligibility for benefits and services from other government programs. Number 105, support oversight of VA's practices in evaluating disability claims and residuals of military sexual trauma. Number 106, oppose subjecting disability compensation and DIC to means testing. Number 113, support a more liberal review of other than honorable discharges for the purpose of eligibility for VA benefits and health care services. Number 114, oppose lump sum payments for service-connected disabilities. Number 115, oppose the imposition of time limits for filing disability compensation claims. Number 116, Oppose any change that would redefine service-connected disability or restrict the conditions or circumstances under which it may be established. Number 117, oppose change of definition of herbicide agents for the purpose of establishing service-connected conditions for disabilities related to herbicide exposure. Number 118, support le legislation to establish presumptive service connection for diseases and illnesses related to contaminants at Fort McClellan, Alabama. Number 119, amend the VA schedule for rating and disabilities for mental disorders. Number 120, compensate Persian Gulf veterans suffering from illnesses circumstantially linked to their service in the Persian Gulf War. Number 121, Support sufficient, timely, and predictable funding for all VA programs, benefits, and services. Number 122, support legislation to include children in legal custody as VA dependents. Number 123, support legislation to increase the number of presumptive diseases related to contaminated water at Camp Lejeune. Number 150, support legislation to expand VA mental health transition services to all service members upon discharge. Number 162, support legislation to improve and reform DIC benefits. Number 167, support the elimination of the 30-day requirement for diseases associated with exposure to contaminants in the water supply at Camp Lejeune. Number 168, support legislation recognizing racial trauma as a stressor for post-traumatic stress disorder. Number 170, support legislation to direct the Secretary of VA to coordinate with VA and with the DOD to verify dependency status. Number 171, support congressional action to ensure the total disability based on individual unemployment ability remains available for all veterans regardless of age or receipt of any other earned federal benefit. Number 172, Remove the delimitating date for Persian Gulf War illness. 
number 173. Support compensable evaluations for certain disabilities, currently at 0%. Number 174, support compensation and pension examinations done by private contractors be placed in the Veterans VA medical record. Number 178, support resources and oversight the appeals process. Number 180, support legislation to increase maximum evaluation and service-connected headaches. Number 221, amend provisions regarding eligibility for automobile adaptive equipment to include the veteran whose service-connected disability inhibits his or her ability to safely operate a motor vehicle. Number 222, support a change to regulatory requirements for temporary and total disability ratings. Number 223, establish immediate authorization for grants of the Board of Veterans Appeals for all cases advanced on the docket. Number 235, support legislative reforms related to the recovery of debts by the VA. Number 241, expand eligibility for mortgage protection life insurance for 100% service-connected veterans. Number 242, support legislation to cap attorney's fees for benefits, counseling, and claim services before the Department of Veterans Affairs. Number 244, support legislation that concedes exposure to herbicide agents of service members who served in Guam, American Samoa, and Johnson Atoll during the Vietnam era. Number 246, provide medical benefits and compensation for Persian Gulf War veterans negatively impacted by sarin gas from the VA. Number 277, support a change in regulatory requirements rating under Section 4.30 under Title 38 CFR to provide for temporary and total rating for incapacitation for more than 21 days. Number 291, support legislation to provide a temporary and total disability compensation rating for an amputee veteran while a new prosthetic device is developed and delivered. Number 294, support legislation to oppose the payments for attorney's fees based on periods of when the attorney was not involved in the claim. Number 295, support legislation to allow for the use of intent to file in cases where an initial or supplemental claim for the same or similar benefit or the same or similar basis was previously decided. Number 297, support legislation for a scientific evaluation to include conditions of the thyroid as presumptive Gulf War disorder. Number 298, support legislation placing the burden of the VA to demonstrate fugitive felon status. Number 299, support legislation authorizing the presumption of service connection for all radiogenic diseases and eliminate dose exposure estimate requirements. Number 305, support legislation to award special monthly compensation at R1 to veterans with anatomical loss or loss of use of three extremities. Number 321, support an increase in the Department of Veterans Affairs burial allowance for service-connected veterans and provide automatic annual adjustments. Number 322, support legislation to provide a realistic increase in VA compensation rates to address the loss of quality of life. Number 323, oppose regional dispersion of the Board of Veterans' Appeals. Number 324, support legislation to require the U.S. Court of Appeals for veterans' claims to decide each appellant's assignment of error. Number 326, increase the benefit rate for the Home Improvement and Structural Alterations Grant. Number 358, support legislation to expand and recognize wartime service periods to include those veterans who served in combat environments from hostile military or terrorist activity from November 4, 1979 through August 1, 1990. Number 374, support legislation that recognizes presumptive service conditions for hypertension and MGUS as related to Agent Orange. Number 375, support legislation to expand radiation risk activities. Number 376, 
support legislation to remove the veteran's personal identification information from his or her claim identification. Number 378, support legislation to clarify and expand entitlement to dependents educational assistance under Chapter 35 for children of two veteran households. Number 379, support legislation to allow expanded entitlement to dependents educational assistance under Chapter 35 for children of two veteran households where both parents are shown with a permanent and total status due to service-connected conditions. Number 3A1, support legislation to allow veterans permanently and totally disabled due to service-connected conditions to continue to receive dependents' compensation for their adult child attending school while the child is in receipt of dependent educational assistance under Chapter 35. Number 409, require VA to request private medical records prior to future examinations. Number 410, provide for a compensable rating for hearing impaired veterans required to use a hearing aid. Number 411, support legislations to establish multiple automobile grants for eligible veterans. Number 412, support using the proposed reduction due process to all disability evaluation reductions. Number 413, support legislation to establish, establish a supplementary special adaptive housing grant. Number 415, support elimination of the link between chronicity and continuity with the chronic diseases listed in 38 CFR section 3.309. Number 423, support legislations to grant aid and attendance to veterans' seriously disabled child. Number 424, support legislation to require VA to implement an optional path for visual impaired veterans. Number 425, remove the requirement for magnification of chloracne and porifia cutanea tarda to acute and subsecute peripheral neuropathy within one year of exposure to Agent Orange. Comrade Commander. Yes. Okay. Excuse me, I did make a mistake and I am being corrected. I will reread it. Resolution number 104 support legislation to exclude veterans' disability compensation for accountable income for purposes of eligibility for benefits and services from other government programs. You're welcome. Sorry about that. Comrade Commander, this completes the report for the Committee on Legislation and Veterans Rights. On behalf of the committee, I move the adoption of these resolutions and the committee be discharged with the thanks of the National Convention. Thank you, Lee. You have heard a motion. May I have a second? Mike Debbie, Four. Debbie Mann. Mike Four. McAgee, State Commander, Department of Minnesota, Chapter 2, so move. In accordance with Rule 9, now is the time for any rejected resolutions to be read. Are there any rejected resolutions you wish read? Hearing none, all those in favor signify aye. aye. Opposed? So ordered. My fellow veterans, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce the Honorable Dennis McDonough. Before coming to VA, Secretary served as the 26th White House Chief of Staff and as Principal Deputy National Security Advisor. He believes deeply, as he testifies to Congress, that there is no more sacred obligation nor, nor noble undertaking than to uphold our promises to our veterans, whether they came home de decades ago or days ago. Please join me in welcoming the 11th Secretary of Veterans Affairs, the Honorable Dennis McDonough. Well, thank you, Andy, for that kind introduction and for your 
unwavering leadership of uh, DAV, our, our kind of our leadership of these organizations coincides. So uh, I hope I continue to have uh, near the success that you're having. So uh, thank you for everything. And good morning to everyone. It's an honor to be here with you today in Orlando for your 100th national convention. Over a century of service to veterans, it's an amazing accomplishment. And let me just start with acknowledging some of the many people deserving of our gratitude. Mark Burgess, your national adjutant. Barry Jezanowski, your national headquarters executive director. Randy Reese, who I was just talking with backstage, your DC headquarters executive director. Linda Helms Prosser, your auxiliary national commander. And Bunny Klaus, your auxiliary national adjutant. And of course, all of your members, each and every one of you. It's great to see so many of you gathered here today. The convention is an exciting time, and it's an honor to be with all of you. But I'd, re, re, I'd be remiss, frankly, if I didn't acknowledge that there is also a touch of sadness as you gather. Sadness that a former DAV member is no longer with us. I'm speaking, of course, of Gary Augustine, whom we lost in March of this year. As most of you know, Gary was a Vietnam vet, wonderful father, family man, an iconic advocate for our nation's veterans, a man long noted for his devotion to DAV, to all of America's veterans, and to our great country. Badly wounded by a landmine in Vietnam, Gary was hospitalized for more than a year and left with lasting injuries that led to his medical retirement from the Army in 1972. But determined to live a life of meaning and fulfillment, Gary married, had two wonderful children whom I met last March, and was a 50-year life member of DAV. He first entered service with DAV as a hospital service coordinator in the VA hospital in Cleveland, Ohio. Then he rose through the ranks to increasing levels of responsibility as deputy national service director, as national service director, and of course culminating in 2013 with his appointment as your national service and legislative headquarters executive director. While overseeing your outstanding service and legislative programs and acting as DAV's spokesman before Congress, the White House and VA, by the way, I used to see him walking through the White House all the time, Gary became a friend to so many veterans, veterans advocates, VA employees, and to all those pursuing the best interests of disabled vets. And I'll say he was less friendly to those who tried to stop them. We will all miss Gary, but his selfless spirit remains with all of us, inspires us all, and lives on in DAV's advocacy for America's veterans. So I just wanted to take a moment today to acknowledge him and to pledge to do whatever I can to carry on his tireless great work. And yeah, I'm for that. And look, there's so much great work that Gary did, and that DAV continues to do. The depth and breadth of DAV's contributions to veterans, of your contributions to veterans, is staggering. In 2021, your volunteer drivers logged over a half million hours and nearly eight million miles transporting vets to VA medical facilities to get them the care they need and deserve. Last year alone, you took over 2 million actions to advocate for veterans, counseled over 290,000 claimants, and assisted over 20,000 transitioning service members. And I'm in awe of the fact that since being chartered by Congress in 1932, DAV has helped veterans with filling more than 12 million claims. 12 million claims. DAV is simply awesome. Some of our nation, you are awesome. Some of our nation's premier advocates for disabled vets. So I thank each and every one of you for all you've done 
and all I know you will continue to do. Now, I want to talk about what we've done over the past year and what we're going to do over the next year to deliver for vets. And I know that it hasn't been an easy year for anybody. But that just means that our shared mission has never been more important than it is right now. And I'm proud to say that together with DAV, we're stepping up for vets and delivering. Since President Biden took office, we've delivered more care and more benefits to more veterans than any time in our nation's history. More care and more benefits to more veterans than at any time in our history. When it comes to delivering the benefits that vets have earned and deserve, we're processing veteran claims faster than ever before, and we've worked together to get the claims backlog down to the lowest total in years. When it comes to honoring vets and the lasting resting places they deserve, we're now providing almost 94% of vets with access to burial sites within 75 miles of home. And we've expanded our legacy, Veterans Legacy Memorial Program, which keeps veterans' stories alive long after they're gone, to approximately 4.5 million vets. When it comes to providing world-class health care to vets and their families, study after study, study after study shows that we're delivering better health care outcomes for veterans than the private sector, which is why 90% of vets now trust us to deliver their care. And when it comes to advocating for vets, with your support, President Biden is leading the way by making veterans a core part of his unity agenda, including securing the biggest budget proposal for vets in VA history, <laughs> delivering, <laughs> delivering the first toxic exposure presumptives for vets who have fought our wars for, uh, for the past 30 years, and most importantly, signing the historic PACT Act into law tomorrow perhaps the biggest expansion of veteran benefits in history. And look, all of that work, every bit of it, adds up to the one statistic that will always matter most. Veterans' lives saved, veterans' lives improved by the work that we do, DAV and VA, together. We've made these strides by asking ourselves three core questions every day we come to work, every time we make a decision, and every time we set a goal. First, are we putting vets at the center of everything we do? That means making VA easy for vets to use via projects like the new VA mobile app, which gives vets access to their benefits right there on your phone. It means making sure that every pathway into VA is a front door to every VA service, so vets have access to everything we have to offer. And it means making sure that we're de delivering for vets on time, every time, through projects like Rob Reynolds is leading on claims automation, which is cutting claims processing time for certain conditions from several months to several days. The second question we ask is, are we improving outcomes for vets with everything we do? That means timely access to world-class care, to earned benefits, and to the lasting rest resting places that vets deserve, no matter what. Because vets, not us, are the ultimate judges of our success. And the third question we ask ourselves goes back to something that President Biden charged VA to do the day I was sworn in, to fight like hell for vets, their families, caregivers, and survivors. Fight like hell. So we use that charge, that question, to guide us every day. That's our North Star. That's what Gary did for so long. That's how we've gotten to where we are. And that's how we'll get where we're going in the future for vets, their family members, caregivers, and survivors. Let me give you a couple of examples. First, we're fighting like hell to maximize access to world-class care for vets. That's why we'll stop at nothing to make sure that vets have the best possible experience wherever they access care, whether that's at home, through community care, or at the VA. For those getting their care at home, we're meeting vets where they are. We're meeting you where you are by doubling down on telehealth and teleappeals. We're also supporting our caregivers who are critical to helping vets age at home where they want to be and where they deserve to be. 
By extending, expanding the program of comprehensive assistance this October to cover all generations of vets. And by changing our policies to allow even more veterans and their caregivers into the program so they can get the support they need. For vets who are getting care in the community, we're working to make their experiences as, time, as timely and as seamless as possible so they get the care they need wherever they live. And those getting their care directly from VA, we're going to modernize our facilities because vets in the 21st century should not be forced to receive care in buildings built in the early 20th century. Instead, we need to build a VA healthcare system with the right facilities in the right places to provide the right care for veterans in every part of the country. And that's exactly what we're going to do. And look, the bottom line with access is the same as ever. Vets who receive their care at VA do better. Our VA clinicians know vets. In many cases, they are vets. And there is nobody better at caring for vets than they are. Just look at the statistics. Vets who come to VA emergency rooms via ambulance are 20% more likely to survive in the following 30 days than, tho than those who were transported to private hospitals, 20%. So please, whenever a veteran comes to you asking where they should get their care, send them to us. Because I promise you this, we're going to get them the world-class care they've earned, and we're going to do it in a timely way. <laughs> Next, we're fighting like hell to end veteran homelessness, a phrase that I believe should not exist in this amazing country. Our focus here is on two simple goals, getting vets into homes, getting homeless vets into homes, and preventing them from falling into homelessness in the first instance. And we're making progress. Last October, for example, we set two ambitious goals to address vet veteran homelessness in Los Angeles, where there are more homeless vets than anywhere in America. The first goal was to get all of the roughly 40 homeless veterans living on what they called Veterans Row, a homeless encampment right outside our West LA facility into housing. The second goal was to get 500 vets in LA into housing by the end of the year, making sure that they're home for the holidays. It's not too much to ask. I'm proud to say that with your help, we not only accomplished these goals, we exceeded them. And that's just the beginning. Nationwide this year, we're going to get 38,000 homeless vets permanently housed. 38,000. We're not going to try to do it or just take our best shot at doing it. With your help, we're going to do it. In fact, halfway through the year, the data through the end of June shows that we've permanently housed more than 19,000 19, homeless vets, putting us on track to meet that goal. And look, as we continue to get this done, we'll be driving hard on prevention, too. We all know it. The cost of housing is going up. So we need to increase the housing supply, make existing housing more affordable, and by getting every vet the wraparound services for substance use disorder, for mental health, for general health, to get them those services that they need. Because no veteran should be homeless in the country they fought to defend. Not one. Not one. Third, we're fighting like hell on our number one clinical priority, and that's to prevent veteran suicide. You may have seen VA's recent report on veteran suicides in 2019. That's the most current year for which we have data. The next year, the 2020 data, will be coming out in the next several weeks. A couple things stand out to me from that report. First, more than 6,000 veterans died by suicide in 2019. 
It's devastating. It's unacceptable. And it's why this work is so critical. But that report also reminded me of something else, which is that suicide prevention is possible and that there is hope. Because there were 399 fewer veteran suicides in 2019 than in 2018, the biggest decrease in 20 years. That's 399 vets who are alive today getting a second chance at life. Nothing, nothing matters more than that. So we're looking to build on that momentum together by providing first of their kind grants to suicide prevention organizations on the ground in communities where communities know their vets best. By rolling out the new 988, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, which connects vets quickly and directly to the Veteran Crisis Line by dialing 988 and then pressing 1 by continuing to offer telemental health sessions to vets who want them, making sure that they get their mental health care exactly when they need it, and not a second later, by ramping up our lethal means safety efforts to prevent warning signs from turning into tragedy, and much, much more. Suicide prevention is our top clinical priority, bar none, and together we're going to keep saving lives and help them help those vets not only survive, but thrive. Fourth, we're continuing to fight like hell to make sure that all vets feel welcome and safe at VA. Not some vets, all vets. That means getting women vets our fastest growing cohort of vets the care they've earned and they deserve. <laughs> I'm for that. It means making sure that LGBTQ plus vets feel supported and well served by every part of VA. It means investigating, identifying, eliminating any racial disparities that exist at VA. And setting up processes to prevent them in the future because VA always leads the way on access. It means helping non-citizen vets stay in the United States where they belong and making sure that eligible deported vets have access to VA benefits. And it means delivering care and benefits to those with other than honorable discharges, too. Because we at VA don't serve some vets. We serve all vets. The bottom line is that for too long, too many vets who fought around the world to protect our rights and freedoms, to protect mine, have had to fight brutal battles here at home for their own rights and freedoms. But at VA, those fights are over. They're over. No veteran is going to have to fight to get the quality care and benefits they've earned, no matter what, who they are, where they're from, or who they love. And last, but in no way least, we're fighting like hell to deliver for toxic, exposed vets. As you know, while Vets, while many of you were out fighting for us, many of you, many of your battle buddies, were breathing in toxic fumes from burn, fit, burn pits and other sources, breathing in particulate matter from those deserts. And months, even years later, they developed conditions that followed them home from war, that impacted their lives, in some cases took their lives, long after the guns had fallen silent. It's our job as a nation to provide those vets, their families, and their survivors with benefits and care for those conditions. And that's exactly what we're going to do. Over the past two years, President Biden has added new presumptive service connection for asthma, rhinitis, sinusitis, and nine rare respiratory cancers. He did that of his own authority. And tomorrow, he will sign into law the historic PACT Act, a bill that will deliver care and benefits to millions of toxic exposed veterans and their survivors, a bill that would not have happened 
without the tireless work of everybody here in this room, everybody watching us online, and this tireless national DAV team. It's a monumental moment for you, for VA, but most of all, most important of all, for all those that we're blessed to serve. With this new law, VA will, work, well, VA will recognize more than 20 new presumptions of service connection for toxic exposure related conditions, ensuring that vets who live with these conditions get the care and benefits they deserve. It will affirm the new process that we have stood up to add yet more presumptions of service condition. We will bring generations of new vets into VA healthcare and increase the healthcare benefits of many more vets, which will result, which will result in better health outcomes across the board. We will deliver benefits to many additional survivors of veterans who passed away from toxic exposure, and we will invest in our infrastructure and workforce to ensure that we can deliver those services in a timely way, including modernizing 31, 31 additional new CBOX. In short, this is perhaps the biggest expansion of veteran benefits in history. And that's a great thing. And rest assured, as I said a minute ago, it would not have happened without you and your hard work. But like anything else of this magnitude, implementing it and executing it won't be easy. So we're going to need DAV's help, especially as Randy and I were just talking in the back room especially with communicating to veterans what's in this bill and what it means for their families and for them. So please, share these messages with any veteran survivor you know first. Any veteran or survivor you know first. We at VA want veterans and survivors to apply for their PACT Act benefits right now. We don't want them to wait. We want them to apply right now. Second. We will begin processing PACT Act benefits for veterans and survivors on the earliest date possible, which is January 1st. Third, any veteran or survivor can learn more about the PACT Act by visiting va.gov slash PACT or by calling 1-800-MY-VA-411. That's va.gov slash PACT and 1-800-MY-VA-411. We put that website up the day the Senate finally passed this bill. And that night alone, we had more than 20,000 visitors to the site. That's what every veteran needs to know about the PACT Act, and we need your help communicating it. Because we want every veteran, every single one, to get the care they need and the benefits they have earned. And we won't rest until they do. So from access to ending homelessness to the PACT Act, that's what we're going to do. That's how we're going to fight like hell for vets, their families, caregivers, survivors. And that's how I'll close my remarks today, with the story of one of those vets who we fight for. The story of Adam Alexander. November 10, 2011, the day before Veterans Day, Adam was grievously wounded in Afghanistan when enemy forces attempted to overrun his outpost. During the fight, a sniper's bullet struck Adam in the forehead, the round exiting the side of his Kevlar helmet. Despite the devastating brain injury, Adam lived. Six days later, he woke up at Walter Reed in Maryland and began a long road to recovery. All told, Adam received more than 10 months of VA rehabilitation services, including 
almost every type of therapy we have to offer. And he came out the other side having met every single challenge. Eventually, Adam returned home, was reunited with his former Ar Army Battalion commander, Mike Hurt. And Mike brought Adam to DAV. To you. To the camaraderie of fellow vets. Now, Mike and Adam, both DAV Life members, have collaborated on a project that helps better serve their fellow vets. Together, they host The Outpost, a half-hour public access television program launched in June 2021 that raises awareness about DAV and provides a platform for local veterans. And Adam has also provided testimony to the Wisconsin State Legislature for a bill to help other disabled vets. Overcoming the greatest odds stacked against him, Adam has proven what other veterans can do for others. A model of tough, persistent, relentless grit in the face of adversity. Tough, relentless, grit. Those are adjectives I think of when I think of DAV. But many of you already know this story because Adam Alexander is DAV's 2022 Disabled Vet, Disabled American Vet of the Year. As your national commander said so well, Adam's story is not one of struggle, it's one of triumph. His lights may have gone out across the world during a battle for his life, but they unquestionably came back. And now he's putting them and the cameras into action. That story, Adam's story, is a perfect example of the perseverance of the veterans that we together get to serve, that we together are blessed to serve. And it's a perfect example of the impact of the work we do together. So, from the bottom of my heart, I thank you for all that you do. And I thank you for working with us to ensure that vets like Gary Augustine and Adam Alexander receive the care and benefits they've earned and that they deserve. Let's serve all of them, all of you, as well as all of them and each of you has served us. God bless you all. God bless our nation's service members, our veterans, their families, caregivers, and survivors. Thank you very much. Thank you again, Mr. Secretary. I would like to call up on Chairman Jim Shuey for the report of the Committee on Hospital and Voluntary Services. Chairman Shuey. That's a tough act to follow. <laughs> Comrade, Commander, and Delegates, the National Convention Committee on Hospital and Voluntary Services was called to order on August 6, 2022 by the committee advisors, Mark E. Bearfield and John Kleinist. The first order of business was the election of the Convention Committee Chairman and Secretary. Jim Shuey was elected as Chairman and Andrea Gail Bennett was elected as Secretary. The committee then proceeded to review the resolution submitted, and I will now report to you the resolutions recommended for adoption by this national convention. For the purpose of saving time, I will read only the number and purpose of the resolution. 010, support enhanced medical services and benefits for women veterans. 011, 
support legislation to grant the President, Vice President, and members of Congress the privilege to use the veteran health care system and to receive their care exclusively from the VA. <laughs> 013, provide comprehensive dental care to all service-connected veterans. Yeah. 014, support sufficient resources for VA to improve health care for veterans living in rural and remote areas. 015, enhance CHAMP VA benefits and services. 016, enhance long-term services and supports for service-connected disabled veterans. 017, ensure VA clinical appeals process protects veterans. 018, support legislation to authorize scholarships for new mental health practitioners in exchange for agreements to serve veterans in VA facilities. 019, support the provision of comprehensive VA health care services to enrolled veterans. 020, oppose any restriction or eligibility of military medically retired veterans to receive care in DOD or VA health, sy health care systems. 021, support legislation to change eligibility for community nursing home program. 022, reduce VA medication co-payments equal to or less than the lowest charge by private sector commercial outlets. 023, support modernizing the VA health care infrastructure. 024, require a veteran's attending VA physician to provide a medical opinion with regards to a claim for VA disability compensation benefits when requested. 025, urge VA medical facilities to provide reasonable access to service dogs, including enclosed animal relief areas. 026, support the expansion of Salat ganglion block research and implementation to treat post-traumatic stress disorder. 027, support legislation to include 1151 protections under Title 38 United States Code for veterans using VA community care services. 037, support sufficient resources for polytrauma units at VA medical centers. 038, support sufficient funding for VA prosthetics and sensory aids service and timely delivery of prosthetic items. 039, require assistive technology training for VA staff who work to rehabilitate blind and visually impaired veterans. 040, urge VA to provide service-connected veterans meaningful access to personal health information. 041, encourage the Department of Veterans Affairs to submit candidates for the DAV Youth Scholarship Program. 042, support a robust, comprehensive rehabilitative and research program for veterans with traumatic brain injury. 055, oppose recovery of third payment third-party payments for service-connected disabilities. 056, support effective recruitment, retention, and development of the VA health care system workforce. 057, support improvements in provider training and beneficiary travel benefits for veterans seeking specialized treatment programs and care for military sexual trauma. 058, support legislation to improve VA programs designed to prevent and treat substance use disorders in veterans. 059, support program improvements and enhanced resources for VA mental health programs and suicide prevention. 060, support sustained and sufficient funding to improve services for homeless veterans. 
0.071, support legislation to extend eligibility of a qualifying veteran's adult child for CHAMP VA. 078, encourage VA to process volunteer applications in a timely manner. 080, adequately fund and sustain the successful readjustment counseling services of the VA and its highly effective VET Center program. 081, oppose means testing service connected veterans for VA health care. 082, support programs to provide psychological support and mental health counseling to family members of veterans suffering from post-deployment mental health challenges for service-connected conditions. 083, support humane, consistent pain management programs in the veterans' health care system. 128, support VA research into the medical efficacy of cannabis for service-connected disabled veterans. One th 131, ensure sufficient resources for VA research to improve care and benefits for veterans exposed to military, toxic, and environmental hazards. 147, support automatic enrollment of medically retired veterans into VA health care system with an opt-out provision. 148, improve urgent and emergency care benefit for service-connected veterans. 149, strengthen and protect the VA health care system. 190, support mandated VA research on and expanded access to investigational drugs for ALS. 191, support new models of care within the VA for veterans with dementia. 192, urge VA to provide prompt screening and treatment of veterans exposed to depleted uranium and support additional research into long-term health effects of such exposure. 193, support adequate funding for research and legislation to improve the care and benefits of veterans exposed to military toxic and environmental hazards. 194, VA should provide low-dose computer tomography scans as part of veterans' yearly physical to effectively screen and diagnose veterans with lung cancer. 227, improve timely reimbursements by VA for purchased care and protect veterans from debt collections and adverse credit reporting associated with such care. 251, support the rights and benefits earned by service-connected Native American and Alaska Native veterans. 253, urge VA to apply a consistent coordinated, coordinated care policy for service-disabled veterans with chronic health conditions who have a home residence in two states. 258, expand eligibility for VA to provide hospital, medical services, and nursing home care to veterans of World War II and the Korean conflict. 328, improve the care provided to veterans with service-connected disabilities, affecting the ability to procreate through assisted reproductive technology. 330, support state veterans home programs. 385, support equity in access to service and benefits for racial and ethnic minority service-connected veterans. 397, encourage the Department of Veterans Affairs to submit candidates for the Volunteer of the Year program. 398, implement a pilot program to assess the effectiveness of post-traumatic stress growth. 399, provide easy and equitable access to VA transportation benefits and services. 400, 
increase capacity at VA facilities by operating extended hours and weekends. 401, establish studies on the long-term effects of exposure to bisphenol, a substance found in plastic disposable water bottles. 402, provide beneficiary travel benefits for unscheduled acute and urgent care from VA. 426, supports a top priority access for service-connected veterans within the VA healthcare system. 427, support legislation to provide comprehensive support services for caregivers of severely wounded, injured, and ill veterans from all eras. 428, conduct well-designed studies to determine effectiveness of hyperbaric oxygen therapy on treatment resistance, traumatic brain injuries, and PTSD. 429, ensure adequate representation of all subgroups of veterans that include service-connected veterans. 430, support VA medical and prosthetic research programs. 431, urge the VA to support comprehensive research on health effects of children of male Vietnam veterans exposed to Agent Orange. 432, repeal beneficiary travel deductible for service-connected veterans and increase reimbursement rates. 433, addri address social detriments to promote health equity among veterans. 434, ensure equity in quality and access from VA and veterans community care program providers. 435, ensure quality and timeliness of the VHA and veterans community care program providers. 436, ensure VA facilities and information resources are accessible to veterans with disabilities. 437, support a consistent benefit for service and guide dogs prescribed by VA providers and examine the benefits of training service dogs. 440, extend appreciation to the VA Orlando Healthcare System for their support of the medical room and the overall success of the 100th DAV National Convention. Comrade Commander, this completes the report of the Committee on Hospitals and Voluntary Services. On behalf of the committee, I move for the adoption of these resolutions and that the committee be discharged with the thanks of the National Convention. Thank you. Thank you. you have heard the motion, may I have a second? Debbie Mann from Chapter 5. Great District of Florida, and um, I move. I so move it. Thank you. In accordance with Rule Nine, now is the time for any rejected resolutions to be read. Are there any rejected resolutions you wish read? Hearing none. All those in favor, signify by saying "aye." aye. Opposed. So ordered. Thank you, Jim. Now we'd like to call Ch Chairman Matt Campanian for the report of the Committee on General Resolutions and Membership. Let's pray. Good morning. Good morning. Comrade Commander and Delegates. The National Convention Committee on General Resolutions was called to order on Saturday, August 6, 2022 by the committee's advisors, John Retzer and Scott Hope. The first order of business was the election of Convention Committee Chairman and Secretary. Matt Kempinen was elected as Chairman and Anna Shermer was elected as Secretary. The committee then proceeded to review the resolution submitted and I will now report to you the resolutions recommended for adoption by this national convention for the purpose, oh, sorry, for the purpose of saving time, I will read only the number and the purpose of the resolutions. 003, seek the immediate release of any Americans 
who may still be held captive following any war and the return and identification of the remains of any Americans who died during these wars. 004, support former POW slave labor claims against Japanese firms. 005, support move to renew prisoner of war and missing in action discussions. 028, support meaningful accountability measures but with due process for employees of the VA. 029, encourage all disabled veterans to become registered voters and vote. 030, support the continued growth of veterans treatment courts for justice involved veterans. 049, provide weekend burials at national cemeteries. 050, extend military commissary and exchange privileges and space available air travel to 30% or higher service connected disabled veterans separated from service prior to October 1st, 1949. 051, condemn public desecration of the flag of the United States. 052, support the construction of a courthouse for the United States Courts of Appeals for veterans' claims. 053, oppose any authorization of use of members of the armed forces experimentation without their knowledge and informed consent. 054, Support legislation to extend U.S. citizenship to honorably discharge service disabled veterans at time of discharge. 283, support for Defense POW MIA Accounting Command. 416, extend the travel area that service connected disabled veterans having a permanent disability rated 100% may travel from within CONUS to CONUS and overseas. 417, extend space available air travel to care caregivers of eligible veterans. 418, support legislation to protect honorably discharged wartime non-citizen veterans with service-connected injuries or illnesses from deportation while applying for citizenship. 419, support federal laws, regulations, programs, and policies that oppose those that diminish DAV's ability to fulfill its missions of assisting service disabled veterans, their families, and survivors. 441, appreciation to the Hyatt Regency Orlando Hotel for the success of the National Convention. 442, appreciate to all who are responsible for the success of the 100th National Convention. 443, Appreciation to National Commander Andrew Marshall. According to tradition, I will read resolution number 443, Appreciation to National Commander Marshall in its entirety. Express an appreciation to National Commander Andrew Marshall. Whereas DAV National Commander Andrew Marshall of Palm Harbor, Florida served honorably in the United States Army and whereas his military career included service in the Airborne Infantryman as an American division in the 173rd Airborne Brigade. Whereas, in December 1970, while serving in the Republic of Vietnam, Marshall was injured as a result of friendly fire while engaged in combat against the enemy. And whereas, while on patrol in January 1971, he stepped on a concealed improvised explosive device resulting in extensive damage to his left leg and foot. And whereas, after receiving the Bronze Star, Purple Heart with Oak Leaf Cluster in lieu of a second award, Army Commendation Medal with V device, Marshall was medically retired from the United States Army. And whereas, after returning home, he became a DAV National Service Officer, beginning a 41-year career with the organization. And whereas during his storied career, he held positions of National Service Officer Supervisor, National Area Supervisor, and Appellate Counsel with the DAV's Judicial Appeals Office in Washington, D.C. And whereas he has held several leadership positions with DAV at the chapter, department, and national levels, including Adjutant, Treasurer, and Commander for DAV Chapter 4 in Tampa, Florida, Adjutant, 
Executive Director and Commander for the DAV Department of Florida, and Judge Advocate for the DAV Department of Maryland. And whereas the membership of the DAV unanimously elected Marshall to lead more than one million member organization as its national commander during the 2021 National Convention in Tampa, Florida. And whereas Commander Marshall has shown outstanding leadership during his year as national commander while advancing DAV's mission and promoting DAV's message before Congress at events and throughout media across the country. Whereas, Commander Marshall made it a key priority, working tirelessly throughout his tenure to ensure veterans timelessly access to mental health care, supports, and services, and improve suicide prevention efforts by the Department of Veteran Affairs. Whereas, he has advocated on behalf of all veterans to ensure properly funded VA so veterans receive the health care and benefits they have earned and the proper recognition of services and sacrifices made by their family members and caregivers and survivors. Whereas he was a fierce advocate for his fellow veterans exposed to toxic substances, pushing hard for the passage of the Sergeant First Class, Heath Robinson honoring our promises to address Comprehensive Toxics Pact Act of 2022. And whereas because of his strong leadership and advocacy, we saw this enactment of this historical legislation, the most comprehensive toxic exposure legislation ever considered by Congress. And whereas now veterans from all eras who were exposed to burn pits, Agent Orange, radiation, and other toxic substances will have the health care and benefits they have earned for their sacrifice. Whereas Commander Marshall has shown incredible compassion during his year as national commander by visiting numerous injured and ill veterans at VA medical facilities nationwide and leading the DAV at the National Disabled Veterans Winter Sports Clinic, all while advancing DAV's mission. Now, therefore, be it resolved that DAV and National Convention assembled in Orlando, Florida, August 6th through the 9th, 2022, expresses its members' heartfelt appreciation and profound gratitude to Commander Marshall for his sacrifices, selfless service, professionalism, and dedication to his fellow wounded, ill, and injured veterans, their families, their survivors, and DAV during his year as DAV National Commander. And be it further resolved that DAV also salutes and extends our sincere appreciation to Commander Marshall's wife, Susan, and his family for their steadfast support and sacrifices during his year as DAV National Commander. Comrade Commander, this completes the report of the Committee on General Resolutions. On behalf of the committee, I move to the adoption of these resolutions and that the committee be discharged with thanks of the National Convention. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Do you have heard the motion? May I have a second? Mike three. Mike, Mike three. Greg Palo, Madison, number two, Wisconsin. I move. Or second. In accordance with Rule 9, now is the time for any rejected resolutions to be read. Are there any rejected resolutions you wish read? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So ordered. It is now my honor and privilege to introduce the president of the DAV Charitable Service Trust, Richard Marbs. A Green Bay, Wisconsin native, Mr. Marbs enlisted in the United States Air Force in 1955 and served as an airborne radio operator. While assigned to medical evacuation and troop carrier squadrons in France and Germany, he was medically evacuated back to the United States following an injury that resulted in the amputation of his leg. He was medically retired due to service-connected disability in 1958. Please give a very warm welcome to the revered leader, Past National Commander Dick Marbs. Past National Commander Dick Marbs served in DAV's highest elected position from 1993 to 1994. In 1978, 
he was named the Wisconsin Disabled Veteran of the Year. Since his retirement in 1987, he has pursued his passion full-time for helping ill and injured veterans. A life member and service officer for Chapter 3 in Green Bay, he has held numerous elected positions at the chapter, department, and national levels. Thank you, Commander, for your very kind introduction. And thank you to my fellow veterans for this opportunity to speak with you about our charitable service trust. As president, let me introduce the trust's governing board. They are Vice President Mark Burgess, Secretary Treasurer Dave Tonmo, and our directors, National Commander Andy Marshall, Denise Williams, Danny Oliver, and Dennis Nixon. In this day and age, it's easy to get caught up in what divides us, what worries us, and what's wrong in the world. No matter how you get your information, we're all bombarded by an abundance of headlines that stoke those negative feelings. But from my perspective, the headlines are misleading. They don't accurately capture all the good that is truly happening in our country, including what so many organizations are doing for our ill and injured veterans and their families. It In my role, I am privileged to highlight their work and the trust role in keeping the promise we've all made to those who've changed in service. While it's not always in the headlines, I could not be prouder of this community of organizations and donors brought together by the trust. You've all provided hope, help, and healing to the lives of countless veterans and their families. I applaud you for that. The trust exists because of donor support. Without their gifts, we would be unable to do our work of helping renew the lives of veterans and their families. Their contributions are evidence of their continued commitment to those who defended our way of life. As we have for the past 35 years, the trust continues to carefully evaluate those whom we partner with. Our nation's veterans deserve the very best support and will continue to provide grants to those organizations that deliver. We've also committed to sound financial stewardship. More than 95 cents out of every dollar donate, donated dollar directly supports programs that contribute to the vehicles the trust makes possible, the victories the trust makes possible. People can confidently give to us and know exactly how we use their money. The trust has been awarded a perfect overall score twice from Charity Navigator, the nation's largest independent charity evaluator. And we've received their coveted four-star rating more than 15 times since first being evaluated. The trust also maintains a guide star platinum seal of transparency, the highest level of recognition offered by guide star. These recognitions wouldn't be possible without the diligent effort of Bridget Sorrell and her team that administers the trust. Thank you for all your hard work. <laughs> Corporate matching gift programs, bequests, and other forms of contributions from corporations, foundations, and individual donors enable the trust to fulfill its mission. In 2021, these gifts, along with income derived from investments, total $21 million, allowing the trust to devote nearly $7 million toward critical health care, education, employment, transition assistance, creative healing, legal services, and therapeutic activities addressing both physical and psychological barriers. Every organization we support does important work for veterans and their families. They reflect our mission of empowering veterans to lead high-quality lives with respect and dignity, 
and we are proud to back their initiatives. One organization I would like to highlight today has taken up the fight against the suicide epidemic afflicting our veteran community, and they're seeing encouraging results. These statistics we hear about service member and veteran suicides are heartbreaking, with 17 a day choosing to end their lives. This affects everyone in our community, whether it's someone we know, something we face ourselves, struggles with mental health are pervasive, and we must respond with urgent force to eliminate suicide in our ranks. Save a Warrior is a leader in this fight and a partner you'll hear about more in the years to come. To date, more than 2,000 men and women have gone through their program, which begins with an intensive 72 hours of cohort-based healing. Facilitators go beyond a veteran's experiences during service to explore the root of what, in some cases, is a lifetime of pain. They have saved and transformed lives. People who have felt they were at their end have come through this program finding purpose and healing. We want to see this continue, so the trust granted Save a Warrior $1 million to build its National Center of Excellence for Complex Post-Traumatic Stress. The building's dedication was this past June. We've also awarded another $200,000 for its programming. Here's a look at our support of Save a Warrior and how the organization is helping to change the lives of veterans who are experiencing mental health issues. Save a Warrior was founded on the possibility that they could step into a space to end the veteran suicide epidemic. Since that time, our organization has also stepped up to encompass and serve first responders, many of which served our country in a military capacity in the past. And uh, our mission is to take an individual that is struggling, that has tried a lot of different other modalities. Maybe they've tried traditional therapy, you know, they've been inpatient, they've been out there searching for some way to get help. Where DAV provides the perfect partnership and stewardship for Save a Warrior is the credibility of partnering with an organization that has a century of reputation for seeing that returning veterans make it all the way home. They have a recipe that is proven to work. So that's why we, we are here and uh, supporting Save a Warrior in this very significant endeavor. Often uh, in-service trauma as well as pre-service experiences combine to make a situation that is extremely disabling for some of our nation's heroes. And we want to be part of a process along with Save a Warrior that helps them look back on their military service not only with pride, but to use it to equip themselves for life after service. We provide this incredible transformative experience for them to take a different path in life, unlike anything else out there where they can come, have a conversation with a peer-to-peer -peer model, with warriors who have sat in the seat just like them, and, and have them basically have that experience that uh, ends up taking them out of the darkness and into the light. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Jake Clark, president and founder of Save a Warrior.
Good morning, everyone. My name's Adam Carr, and I'm a lifetime member of DAV. It's an honor to be down here. I, I represent an organization called Save a Warrior. Over a decade ago, I was on the phone with my team trying to call a former teammate. And I'll tell you what, that silence on the other end of the line was louder than any combat zone I've ever served in. That teammate's name was Tim Mahalik, and little did we know that Tim would take his life that day. We've lost about three veterans around this country since we had breakfast and coffee this morning. And we have it that that's unacceptable. Now you heard the secretary come up here and he talked about nearly 6,000 people in 2019 around this country and the veteran community that had taken their lives. That's nearly the same amount of people that died in combat for this country over a 20-year period in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. That's also unacceptable. Now, I spent my career in the United States Army as a Green Beret operating on the front lines in combat zones all over this country, right at the tip of the spear. Because I believe in this country. I believe in what it stands for. And when I transitioned out, I was looking for an organization to work with, to dive my life's work into, to be a part of that was doing something at the tip of the spear. Save a Warrior is that organization. Looking in disciplines from neurobiology, psychology, psychiatry, mythology, anthropology, mindfulness and meditation. And to date, we've served over 2,000 people with a 99.9% .9 success rate when they've come to us like this. We're so grateful to DAV's executive leadership team, to the Charitable Service Trust, for building this partnership and looking into the future, because we're an organization of innovation. We never stop, we never turn this off. How could we with those numbers? How could we? Barry Jezinoski said to us when we created this partnership, as long as you guys are doing this work, DAV will be there with you to have your back. And we're honored, we're grateful for that because we're just getting started. And it's my honor this morning to introduce to you the founder, a friend of mine, a mentor of mine, of Save a Warrior, Jake Clark spent his entire career serving both on the federal side as an FBI agent, as an LAPD police officer, serving in the Army as an enlisted soldier in Panama in the 80s, and as an officer serving overseas in the Balkans during that conflict. He started this organization with a declaration out of the trunk of his car, and now we stand here before you two months removed from the ribbon cutting of the first and only National Center of Excellence for Complex Post-Traumatic Stress. So without further ado, let me introduce to you Jake Clark. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone at DAV Charitable Service Trust. That's a good looking young man, huh? Wow. That's hard to follow. Thank you, Dick. Thank you to the secretary. Yeah, challenge accepted. Veteran-centered, save a warrior all day long. Improve outcomes all day long. Fight like hell all day long. I'm not gonna embarrass anybody other than myself here today, but I want you to know that there's a veteran in this space today. It happens everywhere we go, and I had the opportunity to meet this person. This person is gonna be coming to Warrior Village in the coming months, and that experience will be transformative and perhaps life-saving. Um, you know, when, when you have an idea um, like Save a Warrior, you, you start w by yourself. And it, it was scary, you know, giving up a paycheck for about four years. There, there were times when 
We didn't know how we were gonna pay for the next cohort, um, the direction that we were headed, but it doesn't look anything like that today. You know, your name's on that building. If, if you're part of DAV, every time we walk out to that new center on a facility that was donated by a very gracious man in central Ohio, the facilities in southern Ohio, it's 350 beautiful acres that this retired businessman spent millions of dollars to buy it out of his own trust to give it away because he was so moved by the mission. You know, I'm, I'm going to tell you something. Barry said it in his statement about pre-service experiences. We specialize in that. After talking to more than 2,000 returning veterans over the last decade, after spending 25 years in recovery myself, because not only am I the hair club president, I'm also a client. <laughs> You know, I grew up, I grew up as a little kid, and I don't recommend this, starting at six years old visiting my mother in mental institutions, and I knew two things. Number one, my mother was not going to get better and come home. And number two, unfortunately, the people to whose care she was entrusted were not that interested in seeing her get well. When you come to our facility, I'm very interested. I'm very interested that you get well. Because my heroes, my entire life, my father is a, uh, my, my late father is a prior service Marine of the Vietnam era. Dad, is that you? He said he would haunt me. Dad, hold my water. Um, you know, when, when this idea struck me, because I was very bothered, like a lot of you are, by these suicides, all of which are preventable. You know, he, he voiced his objections about why I shouldn't do it. You know, I'd come home from deployments. It was my second time in the military. And um, he said, you know, you're in your mid-40s now. You're getting your life back together. And I, and I said, Dad, listen, I, I got nothing but love for you, but I'm going to do this. I'm not, I love you, Dad. I'm not asking your permission. And he said, you know, if you just saved one, it'll all be worth it. And I said, do you mean that? He said, yeah, I mean that. I said, okay, that's a done deal then. And, and I love your motto of keeping our promise to America's veterans. I give you my word that inside of your promise, we're keeping our promise. Because if you know someone, thank you, thank you, thank you. And you know, I had a chance to speak with someone today, as I said, who's gonna spend time with us. And it's just, it just I was so moved, you know, I got to see all the folks from DAV, got to shake hands with the secretary. I invited him to Warrior Village. You want to do me a favor? Get that secretary to Warrior Village because we'll show you what the solution looks like for a particular subgroup in the veteran population. When he talks about fight like hell and Barry Jesenowski talks about pre-service experiences, that's all we deal with all day long. And those secrets come to save a warrior to be exposed, processed, mourned, greened, grieved and put to death. There is a part of us that needs to die, and it's the story that goes with why we want to kill ourselves. Because people just want to be acknowledged for what happened. They want to have their dignity preserved, and they want to heal, and they want to get on with their life, and they want to pay this thing forward. And that's who we are as a community of warriors. We're really, really, really good at coming back for each other. And we stake our lives on that. You don't know what Adam Carr looked like six years ago when I met him. He was on the internet with a bottle of booze, a bag of pills, and a gun, and his wife looking at him in terror as he went live, and that went viral. And that's how I met Adam Carr. You wouldn't know that when he comes up here today looking cleaner than the Board of Health. <laughs> I can go all day. I can go all day. We have almost 2,000 stories like that 10 years later with three suicides, and your help makes all the difference in the world. Please, I beg of you, please help us be in a position where when somebody comes and asks us for our support, that that support is going to be there. Because there's, again, there's a slice in that broad ecosystem of solving this problem. We will absolutely do our part. Please, we're so grateful for everything you've done for us. Bringing that building up out of the mud is a miracle. That started, that started with nothing 
and now it's on this beautiful facility that your name is on. You have an open invitation. Just let us know that you're coming. We would love to show you what you made possible. God bless you. Thank you for everything you pay for it, and God bless America. Thank you, DAV. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jake. We are proud to stand alongside your organization and support the work you do for the veterans on their healing journey. Every veteran's path is different, and no one organization can do it all. This is why the trust exists, to find and partner with the very best organizations in the country that are working toward a common goal of helping veterans and their families. Some veterans need legal assistance. Others may help as they face food insecurity. Some need assistance completing their education or job training. Others may find relief through animal therapy or music therapy or family counseling and programs. Some have found their purpose because of Save a Warrior. Others have benefited from housing assistance, from programs including Swords to Plowshares and Welcome Home Incorporated. Organizations such as Got Your Six Support Dogs provide trained service dogs to veterans in need. Veterans experiencing PTSD have gained valuable job skill training through Patriot's Landing. Another organization I wanted to briefly highlight is Concussion Legacy Foundation. We provided a grant for their Project Enlist program, which does outreach to increase the number of veteran brains donated for research on traumatic brain injuries, post-traumatic stress disorder, and other conditions. They're with us this week, so if you'd like to learn more, I encourage you to visit the booth they have here. The trust can make impactful contributions in all these areas and more because of the generosity of loyal supporters, corporations, and foundations. Thank you to every donor. In this season of uncertainty with the economy, you have continued to prioritize giving in support of those who have given so much of themselves for our country. We promise to continue to be good stewards of your gifts. As I close out this year's report, I also want to thank each of you for the work you've done, the work you continue to do, all in the name of our brothers and sisters who serve this nation. You can learn more about the DAV Charitable Service Trust and keep up to date with our initiatives at cst.dav.org or by liking us on Facebook. Thank you for the opportunity to make this presentation, and thank you for allowing me to share some of the incredible work the Trust Grant recipients do. God bless each and every one of you. Thank you for your attention. This concludes my report, Commander. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Dick. May I have a motion to accept that impressive report? Mike three. Mike three. Comrade Commander, uh, I, Albert J. Bacon Sr., as Department of Florida Commander, Chapter 17, so move. May I have a second? Mike four. Mike four. Tim Walls, Chapter 1, Department of South Dakota, seconds the motion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So ordered. DV played a pivotal role in the implementation of the American Veterans Disabled for Life Memorial, which opened October 5, 2014, and has since become a prominent and profoundly important monument in Washington, D.C. We are proud 
to be joined today by a well-known DAV leader who helped lead the charge to establish this memorial. He has been an in endless presence and determined advocate for its use. Without further delay, please welcome to the stage the Disabled Veterans Life Memorial Foundation President and my good friend, Past National Commander Dennis Joyner. DAV Past National Commander Dennis Joyner was appointed Board President for the Disabled Veterans Life Memorial Foundation in 2015. While speaking about the importance of the memorial service during its dedication ceremony in 2014, Mr. Joyner said, Although I've been blessed with many achievements in life, the achievement I am most proud of is this memorial, a memorial that gives me and the many thousands of other disabled veterans like me a sense of contentment knowing what we gave, what our families gave, and what we continue to give will be forever remembered here in our nation's capital. Thank you, Commander Marshall, for your kind introduction. Adjutant Burgess, national officers, delegates, and guests, it has been nearly eight years since our aspiration of a memorial dedicated to the sacrifice of disabled American veterans became reality. This deeply moving memorial did not happen by accident. It was realized through the hard work and determination of DAV and the auxiliary. If you haven't had the pleasure of walking or rolling through the memorial, I encourage you to check it out the next time you're in Washington, D.C. Trust me, it doesn't disappoint. DAV was a driving force behind this venture, including hundreds of our chapters and thousands of our members. For those of you here who help support the memorial with donations at the individual, chapter, or department levels, thank you. Please give yourselves a round of applause. Now I would like to take a moment and introduce the Disabled Veterans Life Memorial Foundation Board of Directors. Vice President Mark Burgess, Secretary, Secretary Treasurer Gene Murphy, and our directors, National Commander Andy Marshall, Dave Riley, Dave Gorman, Don Samuels, and ex officio member Art Wilson. Maintaining the memorial at the heart of our democracy in our nation's capital is no easy task and would not be possible without the thoughtful consideration of these dedicated veterans. Thank all of you. October 5th, 2014, the day the American Veterans Disabled for Life Memorial was dedicated. It is a date seared into my memory and my heart. It was the pinnacle of nearly a two-decade campaign to honor those men and women who have given so much for our nation. Thank you. But our work did not stop there. When one task is completed, even one as demanding as building such a beautiful memorial, many more opportunities arise. Since 2014, our foundation has concentrated on getting the word out so current and future generations will come to fully appreciate everything disabled veterans have done for them. It has also set out to maintain the memorial and improve its existing structures. Despite the turbulent past few years, the memorial has stood as a symbol and vigorous reminder of those who shed blood to defend our freedom. Throughout the pandemic, the memorial's message with you, with the You Visit virtual tour, was more important than ever, offering visitors the opportunity to experience it from the comfort and safety of their homes. This technology allows more people to become aware of the memorial and its important message. DAV has also promoted it across its social media pages, underscoring the deep partnership that we have together. In 2021, the tour captured the attention of more than 1,400 unique visitors, bringing the total visitors to roughly 14,900 since the site's launch. Online visitors stem from all over the United States, as well as 12 other countries. Applause 
A new call to action button titled Veterans Assistance has been included on the website. Now with a click of a button, visitors are taken to the Veterans Landing page of the DAV website where they can find their nearest National Service Office and learn more about what DAV has to offer and get connected with employment resources, just to name a few. Once again, our outstanding volunteers from DAV Chapter 10 in Arlington, Fairfax, Virginia, continued to meet to clean the memorial by offering their most precious resource, their time, particularly during Saturday mornings, they will ensure the memorial will, re will reflect the respect it deserves. Let's take a look and see how it went. Very special memorial since I'm a wounded veteran and to get other service members to come out and realize the, the duty and the honor and respect that we're giving back to our nation, even, even though they've already given so much, means everything to me. We want to make sure that the memorial looks good and at the same time when we're cleaning it, we get to read everything too, all over again. They resonate so well with many of us as being disabled veterans. Uh, we want to make sure that everybody else that's here gets to see that message as clear as possible. Here lies the cost of war, a memorial dedicated to men and women who sacrificed so much that they're living examples of that sacrifice. It's just a testament to veterans living with something for the rest of their lives that most people don't understand. It's a reminder we all have scars. Great job. Great job to all of the volunteers and a heartfelt thank you to Chapter 10 for your continued dedication to the memorial and your fellow veterans. Thank you so much, Chapter 10. Just as, it, just as it took the extraordinary generosity of many people and organizations to, be built, to build the memorial, it will take the same commitment to keep it pristine and in front of Americans' minds. It is now on all of us to continue our mission of education and outreach. It falls on the very people in this room to promote the memorial and do what we can to make the public aware of its existence, its significance, and all that it represents and honors. In order to help spread the word, we've included a brochure about the memorial in your convention bags. It is my sincere hope that you will take just a few seconds out of your day to review the materials and share it with others back home. To every member of the Board of Directors, past and present, for the to the entire DAV, including state departments, chapters, and of course, the auxiliary, thank you for your unwavering support. I hope that you'll walk away from this with a newfound sense of pride for everything that you have done to make this noble project a reality. Please give yourselves and one another a resounding round of applause. But our work is not done. We will continue to stand alongside National Park Service staff, volunteers and supporters in improving the site as needed and providing a means for both veterans and their loved ones to access its meaningful message throughout the country. To take the virtual tour or learn more about the American Veterans Disabled for Life Memorial, please visit avdlm.org. You can also follow us on Facebook. Thank you, Commander. This concludes my report. Thank you, Denny. May I have a motion to accept that report? Mike three. Mike three. I'd, take, uh, I'd like to do a motion to accept the report. Chapter five, Florida. Thank you. Name? I was trying to get this right. I'm sorry, Commander, sir. I'm Debbie Mann, chapter yeah. five, Florida. May I have a second, please? This side of the room, you can participate. Mike, 
Mike four. Mike one. DAV Department of California, past state commander, Leroy Acosta, second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Oppose. So ordered. Now, will you please welcome Burl Jimerson, newly elected president of the Commanders and Adjutants Association for 2022 and 2023. National Commander Marshall, National Adjutant Burgess, National Officers, and Delegates and Guests. Good morning. I'm proud to have been elected as President of the State Commander and Adjutants Association for 2022-2023. We pledge to continue our support of national organizations through our sponsorship of the state commanders and adjutants orientation. The Midwinter Conference, the, mid, uh, the Winter Sports Clinic, we look forward to another very productive year in the DAV. I would like to read into the record the, our officers and committees for the coming year. President, Burl Jimerson. Vice President, William Robinson. Executive Committee, Pamela Beal, Kurt Johnson, Michael Elmore, Lisa Gregory, Betty Minus, Deborah Olson. Past President, Brian Wilner. <laughs> Secretary Treasurer, Rita Abereg. Assistant Treasurer, Dave Tannenbaum. Judge Advocate, Floyd Watson. Chaplain, Jerome Washington. Assistant Chaplain, Jeanette Taylor, or Juliet Taylor. Sergeant at Arms, Jerry Estes, Hugo Perez. Audit, Paul Lardizon, Nancy Espinosa, Thomas Ayala. Constitution and Bylaws, Gregory Dunham. Jamie Jacob, J. Halford Pandos, Bill Dolan, Resolutions, Donald Peak Jr., Mary Ann Keckler, Special Projects, Danny Oliver, Richard Barazas, Vicki Brown, This time, would the National Commander Marshall and National Adjutant Burgess please join me to receive a presentation. On behalf of the State Commander and Adjutants Association, I would like to present you to, with two donations from the National Service uh, Foundation. One, it is with great deal of pleasure that I present our donation of $3,000 to the DAV Service Foundation. In addition, an additional check for $100 in, the, in our past President Brian Wilner's honor.
Now, ladies and gentlemen, I like anyone who wants to support the National Service Foundation but hasn't done so at the booth to please make your way to the back of the room. Uh, I'd ask that you do it as quietly as possible. If you've already donated at the booth, please bypass the table in the back and take your place in line. Incorporated in 1986, the DEV National Service Foundation has played a unique role in safeguarding the long-term financial stability needed to support DEV services at the local, state, and national levels. Using resources from the foundation, DEV is able to continue caring for veterans of today and tomorrow. Although one of the foundation's core missions is support DEV's daily work to meet the most significant and immediate needs of veterans, increasing public awareness about the foundation's mission is an extremely important com component of what the foundation does. When they are able to open the hearts and minds of the American people, they better understand the needs of ill and injured veterans and their families, which in return enables all of us to do our part to ensure veterans are properly cared for for the long term. This includes providing free professional assistance with disability claims and benefits, no cost transportation to and from medical appointments, and other vital services imperative to the quality of life of veterans and their families. With service before self in mind, it is only fitting and an honor to introduce the president of the DV National Service Foundation and past national adjunct of DV, my friend Arthur H. Wilson. A native of Massachusetts, Art Wilson enlisted in the Air Force in September 1962. He served as a runway construction specialist in Vietnam, the Philippines, Thailand, and Taiwan from 1964 to 1966. Immediately after his discharge, Mr. Wilson became the first of his era to join DAV's professional staff as a National Service Officer Apprentice in Atlanta. He was appointed as DAV's National Adjutant and CEO in 1994, a position he held until his retirement in June 2013. Following his retirement, he was elected president of the DAV National Service Foundation and serves as an ex officio member of the Disabled Veterans Life Memorial Foundation Board. Good morning. Thank you, Commander, Adjutant Burgess, National Officers, and all of our members, friends, and guests. I want to thank you for your very long support of the National Service Foundation. This year has been a banner year for the Foundation and its mission to stand up and support our DAV. In 2021, DAV service officers submitted more than 151,000 claims for more than 422,000 injuries and illnesses on behalf of veterans, their families, and their survivors. Our NSOs, in spite of the ongoing uncertainty related to COVID, retain vital capabilities to our toll-free hotline to ensure that we're available to advocate for benefits at all times. The Columbia Trust grants of nearly $1.2 million to help chapters and departments provide medical transportation, coordinate volunteerism in hospitals, enable department and chapter service programs, and support and assist other initiatives that those that combat homelessness. So Trust helps chapters and departments purchase 61 new vehicles, which contributed to the almost 164,000 rides that we provided at no cost. Now, to put that in perspective, the 7. million miles DAV volunteers drove 
are the equivalent of traveling to and from the moon 16 times. Put that one down. But we are grateful to have supported many of the 161 hospital service coordinators nationwide who oversaw transportation and ensured our veterans received the care that they earned. We are also grateful to have aided many of the 235 state level and 1,992 chapter level service officers who were on the front lines ensuring veterans' claims for benefits were protected. In 2021, we dispersed more than $4.8 million to support DAV's mission. The majority of those funds went to the National Service Program. We've helped to ensure that they received essential tools and resources to help veterans achieve justice based on the sacrifices that they have made. In 2022, we marked 91 years since the establishment of the foundation. For nearly as long as the VA has existed and DAV has been pushing for care and benefits for veterans, the foundation has ensured that our ability to advocate to, ser to serve continues no matter what happens. As surely as DAV fights to guarantee the promises that are kept, the foundation exists to safeguard that sacred mission and protect and augment the many programs and services that provide hope to our wounded heroes, heroes their families, and survivors. For the last 41 years, it has been my sincere honor and privilege to be intimately involved in the Foundation's mission. And though my hair was certainly darker, <laughs> darker then and a, a bit more of it, I'm extremely proud of the impact that we've wished and witnessed with your support. In 1981, the revenue for the Foundation totaled just over 282000 which is around 920000 in today's dollars. We can and should be very proud that the Foundation's total support in revenue today topped $12 million at year's end. Back then, the net assets were just about 5.3 million in today's dollars. Today, they top 151 million dollars. <throat> For nearly as long as DAV has been serving veterans, the foundation has been a close partner and ally that has provided ongoing support and stability. It's been my pleasure to see some of the very innovative ways that we've contributed to that mission. Since its establishment, grants exceeding nearly $35 million have empowered our leaders at every level to purchase vehicles, conduct essential programs and services in spite of limitations that they may have in terms of available funds. And we've supported DAV's nationwide efforts in many key areas. Here are just some of the many highlights that I've had the pleasure to see with your incredible support. In 1990, as our nation ramped up for the war in the Persian Gulf, the fund established an expert medical and vocational opinions program. This groundbreaking initiative allowed our professional National Service Officer Corps to procure expert medical opinions so we could enhance our ability to get justice for the veterans that we represent. In 1996, we developed the Colorado Trust, later renamed the Columbia Trust, for allowing leaders at every level to spread the wealth. Through your contributions, financially disadvantaged chapters with important and creative service initiatives have been able to tap into a pool of funds to support veterans in the ways that could otherwise have been impossible. In 2000, the Foundation funded a pre-discharge outreach program by purchasing computers and materials needed to train and equip DAV's Transition Service Officer Program. 
Over the course of the last four decades, the Foundation has funded numerous DAV outreach initiatives, documentaries, and special campaigns. Those include the Toxic Poisoning Project, Service When Women Come Marching Home, the National World War II Memorial, a testament to freedom, the March of the Bonus Army, and Korean War Stories. And by the way, not to go all Hollywood on you, the Korean War Stories won an Emmy Award. The Foundation provided seed money the DAV needed to expand our representation at the U.S. Court of Veterans' Appeals for Veterans' Claims. More recently, the Foundation partnered with DAV and funded the training and resource program ITRAC, which is vital to platform to ensure DAV's continued primacy in the leader of benefits advocacy. Forgive the history lesson here, if you will, but as I reflect on this time, it makes me think of many veterans who contributed to this aspect of our mission and many whose lives have been enhanced because of the National Service Foundation. I think of Dick Cosgrove, a good friend who served the, as the Foundation's president for 25 years. Dick's life was changed dramatically in World War II and was, he was, as he was medically discharged in 1945. He joined DAV Chapter 2 in San Diego, was an active member who dedicated most of his life to our mission. You may know him better as the namesake for our Richard J. Cosgrove Pace Setting Performance Awards. In fact, at this time, I'd like to call upon National Service Director Jim Marzalek to the stage so, as we can pre present this important honor. The Richard J. Cosgrove Pace Setting Award Performance Awards recognizes the National Service Office in each division that has the largest combined total of contributions made in its name. The 2021 winners, Division I, the National Service Office in Sacramento, California, with a total of $17,300, and accepting on their behalf is NSO Supervisor Diana Kamak. Division two, the National Service Office in Providence, Rhode Island, with a total of more than $9,700. Welcome NSO Supervisor Mike Sambreed to accept the award on their behalf. Division three, the National Service Office in Chicago, Illinois, with a total of more than $18,000. NSO Supervisor Robert Bettenowitz is here today to accept on their behalf. Division four, the National Service Office of St. Louis, Missouri, with a whopping total exceeding $75,000. And representing our division four winners from the St. Louis National Area Supervisors, Andrew Edwards. Division five is the National Service Office in Seattle, Washington, with a total of over $11,000. Accepting on their behalf is NSO Supervisor Jacob Holland. Congratulations. 
Division VI, the National Service Office in Cleveland, Ohio, with a total of nearly $21,000. And here today to accept the District VI, VI Award is NSO Supervisor Jacob Drost. Please join me again in thanking our nationwide Corps of incredible National Service Officers. From the gallows of the last recorded words of the Revolutionary War, Patriot, Patriot Nathan Hale, where I only regret that I have but one life to give for my country. As remarkable as that is, I think in many ways, the people who have supported the foundation and the people it supports have gone further. Today, I also think of my dear friends who suffered blindness, brain injuries, amputations, and other catastrophic wounds that in effect resulted in them contributing an entire way of life to our national defense. And after they continued to serve and give what life they had, to, to save one another, and I, I regret, I regret too that I have only one life to give in service to DAV. But I'll tell you this, it's been one hell of a ride for me and my family. When I returned from Vietnam, it was a great honor to be the first in my era to join DAV's professional NSO staff. But greater still has been the honor of meeting and serving alongside so many great people, all of you. Thanks so much for your support. Your support has placed the foundation in such a stable position to continue its mission. All that said, friends, I want to tell you that I'm going to be stepping down as foundation president after this convention. It's time. It's been a tremendous blessing to serve alongside each of you, and I'm confident that the future of this great institution is in very good hands. And although I appreciate any goodwill that you may have to share this to this day, I hope that you do so in the form of a support to the DAV National Service Foundation. Every cent you donate will not only support the many service initiatives the Foundation backs, it'll put DAV in even better position to safe, safeguard our great charity for many years to come. You can also donate online or by mail on the addresses noted on the screen. This is a way to donate in honor or to commemorate our friends, brothers and sisters, and show our commitment to America's finest. To kick off this time of giving, I'm pleased to acknowledge contributions from the Memorial Rearmament League of $2,100, Finnegan, Henderson, Farbro, and Gunner, $50,000. So now it's your turn to speak and to show the nation what you and your chapter or department are willing to do to support the cause with us, that you brought with us here today. Can I start this off, Mr. Wilson? Yes, sir, you have, you, you have the you have the floor. A personal donation, one thousand dollars to the National Service Foundation, and a personal donation, one thousand dollars to the Columbia Trust. Chairman Wilson, National Commander Marshall, Adjutant Burgess, uh, on behalf of Arthur A. Macau, Chapter One, Sioux Falls, Department of South Dakota. We'd like to donate $500 to the National Service Foundation. Thank you. From the state of South Dakota, I'd like to give $500 to the National Foundation. My name is Scott Stevenson, representing Chapter 158 from the great state of New York. I have uh, three donations. 
The first one is from our chapter 158 for $1,000 for the Just Be Kids program. The second one is for the National Service Foundation from the Department of New York as Department Commander for $30,000. And the third one is a donation to the Just Be Kids program for $20,000 for a total of $51,000 from New York. Thank you. I'm Alan Pritchard, uh, DAV Chapter 2, Huntington, West Virginia. We donate $2,000 to the National Service Foundation in memory of Herschel Woody Williams, USMC. <laughs> Morning. My name is John Maselli. I'm the commander for New York Chapter 144. I'm proud to say we'd like to make a $2,000 donation to Kids Just Be Kids. I gave it to you. Uh, Mick Aguirre, State Commander from Minnesota. I'd like to present the Columbia Trust with a donation of $15,000 from the Department of Minnesota. From the great state of Minnesota, past uh, Department Commander Ron Haugen, the Minnesota DAV Foundation donates $15,000 to the National Service Foundation. Good morning. On behalf of District 14, the states of Minnesota, Montana, North Dakota, and South Dakota, We'd like to donate $250 to the National Service Foundation. A.J. Bacon, Sr., from the great sunshine state of Florida. On behalf of the Department of Florida, it's my honor and privilege to donate $5,000 to the National Service Foundation, as well as $5,000 to the Columbia Trust. Again, the Department of Florida. I'm John Raber from DAV Chapter 18 in Bradenton, Florida. Our members will donate again $12,500 to Just Be Kids. Thank you very much. Bill Dolan, Department of Nevada, Commander, Chapter 15, Perump, Nevada, $500 donation to the National Service Foundation. Chapter 1, out of uh, Reno, Department of Nevada, Jerome Washington. On behalf of our department, our members, we have several donations here. We have 2,000 to the National Service Foundation, 1,000 to the charitable service, and we have a $500 donation to each of the following. Disabled Veterans Life Memorial Fund, the Jesse Brown Memorial Youth Scholarship, the Transportation Vehicle Grant Program, and Just Be Kids. Totaling a donation of $5,000 from the Department of Nevada. From the great state of Georgia, I am Sadie Hill, the Department Commander. We would like to donate um, $2,500 to the National Service Foundation, $2,500 to Columbia Trust. Ken Couture, Commander of the State of Illinois. We, we have $10,000 going to the clinic and six going to the uh, service. I'm Al Reynolds, Commander of Chapter 17, uh, Macon County, Illinois. I got three donations. I got $10,000 to the National Service Foundation, $10,000 to the sports clinic, and uh, $10,000 to the National uh, Disaster Relief.
I'm Al Bowers, and Terry and I have donated each year. At the end of my financial, because I'm the secretary treasurer of the foundation, at the end of my uh, report, I always say, and we are giving $1,000. Today, I just gave 2500 Thank you. St. Louis, Missouri, Chapter 1 donates $10,000 to the National Service Foundation in memory of the NSO office in St. Louis. Department of Maine would like to donate $750 to the Columbia Trust and $750 to the National Service Foundation. John F. McPherson, Chapter 1 Maine, is also do donating $750 to the National Service Foundation. Greg Palo, Senior Vice Commander for the Department of Wisconsin. We donate $2,000 to, to the National Service Foundation. My name is Richard Connor from the state of Massachusetts. I'm the commander. We'd like to give $1,000 to the National Service Foundation and $8,000 to the Columbia Trust. Thank you. Tom McCoy, Department of Arizona, donates $2,500 to the National Service Foundation. On behalf of the Department of Ohio and its members, please accept our gift to the National Service Foundation the amount of $100,000. can't follow that one up too well. I'm Mike Stith, Chapter 35 of Ohio, with $1,000 for the National Service Foundation in honor of our NSOs. That's Jake and Matt and uh, Richard and Steve and all the NSOs and staff at the Cleveland office. Thank you. Good morning, George E's Command of District Columbia Department. We pledge $500 to the National Service Foundation. Good morning, my name is Joan Sabri, second junior vice commander from the awesome Department of Maryland. We would like to donate $5,000 to DAV National Emergency Relief Fund. On behalf of Commander Terry Lynn and State Adjutant Samuel Petrovich, I would like to make a donation to the National Service Foundation from the Department of Pennsylvania and a personal check for $1,000 to the National Service Foundation in memory of my brother, Kenneth, a veteran of the Korean War and a Navy corpsman who died from what I believe to be service-connected condition in August of 1995, and my brother Elman, who was a U.S. Army Air Force pilot who was killed in action in January of 1944. Hank Baker, Commander, Department of Tennessee. We've donated $2,500 to the Winter Sports Clinic, $2,500 to the Columbia Trust Fund. Thank you. My name is Lee Giddon, Chapter 35, located in Akron, Ohio. Our chapter proudly donates $5,000 to the NSO. $5,000 to the Jesse Brown Foundation, and $1,000 to Veteran Services. Uh, 
I'm Commander Joe Mosling, and on behalf of the Golden State of California, we proudly contribute $10,000 to the National Service Foundation and $1,000 to the Charitable Service Trust. Thank you. Nancy Espinoza, Davis County Chapter 14, Department of Utah. We donate $2,000 to the National Service Foundation and $5,000 to Just Be Kids. I'm Ken Mestis from the state of Colorado, and we would like to donate $2,500 to the National Foundation. Michael Schivelbein in Colorado, Chapter 7, would like to donate $1,500 to the Columbia Trust and $1,500 in honor of our awesome uh, service officers out of Colorado. Thank you very much. Good morning, comrades. My name is Will King. I am out of General Washington, Chapter 7, out of the most awesome state of Virginia. And I'm proud to announce that we are donating $20,000 to the National Service Foundation. I'm Dwayne Ramey from the most awesome state of Virginia, and we donate $20,000 to the National Golf Tournament. Good morning. I'm the immediate past department commander, Cynthia Bailey from the most awesome state of Virginia. We're donating $25,000 to disaster relief. I'm Francis Mitchell. I'm the department commander for the awesome, awesome, awesome state of Virginia. We are donating $40,000 to the Winter Sports Clinic for a total of $105,000 from Virginia. I'm Bob Plunk from the natural state of Arkansas. We're donating $1,500 to the Columbia Trust. Good morning, Ann Shermer from the great state of Oklahoma, uh, past department commander. We're donating $1,000 to the National Service Foundation in honor of our great NSOs out of Muskogee. And I'd like to thank all of the Oklahoma chapters and units for donating, helping our youth, our juniors, raise $5,001 for the golf clinic. Thank you. I'm Kim Tatham from the Show Me State, and I have two personal donations, one for the National Service Foundation of $2,000 and 2000 for the Charitable Service Trust in honor of our outstanding NSOs in our St. Louis office. David Gerke, Commander of the State of Missouri, uh, 25000 to the National Service Foundation in honor of the St. Louis Service Office. Dean Travis, past department commander for Missouri. We're donating $25,000 for the Winter Sports Clinic. Anna McDonald from uh, Chapter 2, Senior Vice. I have two donations. First one is to the Disabled Ver Veterans Golf Clinic for $5,000. The second one is to the Winter Sports Clinic for 20000 Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Lawrence Dixon, commander of Chapter 2 in Kansas City, Missouri. I'm proud to donate, not me, but our Chapter $20,000 to Disabled Veterans Natural Service Foundation in honor of the NSO of St. Louis. Good morning, I'm Bill Muffley, Senior 
Vice Commander, uh, Department of Delaware, and we'd like to make a contribution to the National Service Foundation of $200 in memory of a PDC, Arthur Chick. Good morning, my name is Ray Ariola from the great state of Texas. I represent Chapter 20 of Blue Bond Chapter, and we're donating $1,000 to the National Service Foundation and $500 to the Charitable Service Fund. Thank you. Uh, Maxine Nixon, Auxiliary, Texas. We have juniors here. Thank you. Uh, they do a fundraiser every year, and they're excited to be here. Uh, thanks to our chapters, our units, and our leaders, our juniors can do this. We have their support. We have Atticus and Joshua. We have a donation for the National Disabled Veterans Golf Clinic for $5,000. And they like the big checks. Good morning, I'm Roxanne James, the Senior Vice Commander from the Department of South Carolina. And I'm Andy Miller, the Department Adjutant for the great state of South Carolina. And we're here this morning to give three checks. One is for the sports clinic, one is for the National Service Trust, Trust and the other one's for the Columbia Trust. Good morning, I'm Leon Booker, commander of William E. Tate, chapter number one from the great state of Georgia. We'd like to make a donation for $1,000 to the Charitable Service Trust and $1,000 to the National Service Foundation. Bretha Humphrey, commander from the great state of North Carolina, home of Camp Lejeune and Fort Bragg. We donate $1,000 to the National Service Foundation and $1,000 to the Charitable Service. Good morning, my name is Eric Owens. I'm the Department Adjutant for Kansas. We donate $5,000 to the DAV National Service Fund. I am Joe Hall from your favorite vacation destination, North Dakota. Adjutant, uh, we are donating $5,000 to the National Service Foundation. My name is Ernie Boyswood. I'm with Chapter 12 in Rhode Island, and we donated $500 to the National Service Foundation and $500 to Columbia Trust. I challenge all of you next convention to come up here and make your donations. I'm Al LaBelle, uh, Department of Wisconsin, Chapter 57. Uh, I would like to make three personal donations. Uh, first of all, uh, a donation of $500 to the uh, Charitable Service Trust in the name of uh, Joy Elam, whose outstanding, inspiring leadership of the legislative department as director. Second one would be to uh, Shane, uh, uh, would be $250 to uh, the National Service Foundation in the name of uh, Shane Learman, who as deputy national legislative director was instrumental in the passage of the PACT Act. And the third one would be a kind of an unsung hero uh, in the name of Peter Dickinson, who was 
instrumental in making sure the provisions in the PACT Act were done as we desired. And finally, I have a personal message to National Commander. For the first time in over 100 years, on Saturday, I rode in a Model T around the city of Tampa, and I just want you to know that it was much smoother ride than the ride to the 1922 TAV National Convention in San Francisco. With that, Wow. The quick math tells me that was about $800,000. I would like to just take uh, a moment for final thanks to all of you. In particular, I want to thank Gary Burns, past foundation president, Mark Burgess, Bridget Sorrell and her staff who administers the foundation, Nancy O'Brien, who ministered the foundation many years prior. <laughs> and if I don't want to spend the rest of my life on the couch, my best friend and partner, Mary Wilson. <laughs> By the end of the day, it's you, the folks who have supported our great charity for these many years who deserve the great credit. Although I'm stepping down, I won't be far. I'm going to look forward to continue my 56 years of service as an active DAV member and thank you for making the foundation and the DAV organization deserving of a humble servant's life's work. God bless you all and thank you. Thank you, Art, for your outstanding report and continued leadership. May I have a motion to accept the report from President Wilson for the National Service Foundation? Mike Two. Mike Two. Michael Kerr, past day commander, California, Chapter One. So moves. May I have a second? Mike Chapter Three. One. Thomas Ayala, Chapter One, Florida. Second. All those in favor, aye. aye. Opposed? So ordered. I would like to call on Chairman Rob Reynolds for the final report of the Committee on Constitution and Bylaws. Comrade Commander and Delegates, good morning still. I will now proceed with the second reading of the proposed changes to the Constitution and bylaw which, which are recommended for adoption. In the interest of time, again, I will read only the number and purpose of the resolutions. Resolution number one, allow DAV chapters to conduct routine meetings of governing body using virtual platforms, but continue to require in-person participation of delegates and alternates for department and national conventions. Resolution number 421, add the following as Article 7, Section 7.8, Paragraph 5 of the National Bylaws. No person shall succeed himself or herself as national commander. This is already ratified in DAV's Constitution. Resolution number 422, delete Article 14, Section 14.5, Paragraph 3 of the Bylaws. This is a housekeeping matter, given the issue is dated and specifically covered in Article 13, Section 13.1 of the National Bylaws and the Board of Director, Policy 8. Comrade Commander, on behalf of the committee, I move that the committee recommendations be accepted. 
that the resolutions be adopted and that the committee be discharged with the thanks of the National Convention. Thank you, Rob. You have heard the motion. May I have a second? Mike three. Mike three. Libby Mann, Chapter Five, Florida. I second it. In accordance with Rule Nine, now is the time for any rejected resolutions to be read. Are there any re rejected resolutions you wish read? All those in favor, signify five by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carried. In the ladies' restroom, someone left a wedding band. <laughs> All right, so if you want to claim it, come up to the podium after we're done shortly. And it better fit your hand. All right, <laughs> or finger. All right. Mark, do you have any announcements? Thank you, Commander. Immediately following this morning's business session, the final meeting of the nominating committee will be held in Florida Ballroom C. This afternoon's final business session will promptly uh, begin at 1.30 p.m. We'll start off with the important business of nominations and elections of officers. Please be on time. Pick up your line officer dinner tickets between sessions right outside the exit to, the, to this ballroom. This new method is designed to alleviate waiting in line. Tickets will be available until just before the doors open at 6 p.m. We're again giving away three $50 gift, gift certificates that can be redeemed in a DAV store right here in front of the stage as soon as we uh, um, adjourn. And the lucky winners are Jeffrey Blonder, Massachusetts E.F. Gilmore, Chapter Number 64, Chad Riggs, Missouri, East Shubin Hike, Chapter Number 2, and Jose Romero, New Mexico, Luchada Kastner, Chapter Number 15. Commander. Thank you, Mark. Chaplain Varner, will you lead us in prayer? May we pray, almighty creator, we once again want to give you thanks for the gift of unity. We thank you, Father, that this gift has inspired us to establish great relationships in this place as we continue to work together. And now because of this gift, we complement one another's strength that cancel out all weaknesses. As a team, we look forward to being united in one body of this great organization that we stand for reasons, purpose, visions, and determination. And we give you thanks once again. And the people say it, amen. Thank you. Remember, waiting band up front, the convention stands in recess until 1.30.